Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Six Months of Set Theory and Higher Order Logic. In this video we're going to be looking at, is the null set super complete? And looking at a line-by-line -line proof of that claim. So, we mentioned previously that without Axiom 3, which states that the null class is a set, the universe might just be the null class. For this to be the case, the null class must satisfy only the first two axioms, because those were all we had before Axiom 3. The first two axioms say that the universe must be transitive, and it must be swelled. For both of those things to be true, in other words, the universe must be super complete. So if we want to test whether a, not a certain set or class, rather, is the universe, that class must be super complete. Any super complete class could be the universe. In this video, we're going to prove that the null set itself is super complete. And therefore, without Axiom 3 telling us that it's a set and not a class, we couldn't show that the universe wasn't empty. So, in other words, the goal is to prove the following statement. For all x and all y, x is a subclass of y and y is a member of... The null set implies that x is a member of the null set and for all w and all z, W is a member of Z, and Z is a member of the null set, implies that W is a member of the null set. Intuitively, it really should be clear that these are vacu this is vacuously true, since the null set doesn't have any members. But to practice using these definitions, it's going to be useful to prove this. So if you're struggling with these proofs or struggling with conceptualizing why this might be, take a look at this statement with me, and let's break down how we can tell that this is going to be true. So we start with our conjunction. For a conjunction to be true, both halves of it have to be true. So the transitive part has to be true and the uh, swelled part has to be true. The first conjunct and the second conjunct. So both of them have to be true for it to work. The main operator of each of those conjuncts, in turn, is the implication operator. For an implication to be true, either the antecedent can be false, or the consequent can be true. Let's look at the antecedents of both of these. The antecedents of both of these are conjunctions. For a conjunction to be true, like we said earlier, both parts of it have to be true. Well, we don't know much about x is a subclass of y or w is a member of z. Those could be true or could be false, depending on which x and y and w and z you pick. But the second half of the conjunction, we have a pretty good idea of what's going on here. Y is a member of the null set, and Z is a member of the null set. We can tell that both of those are false just based on the definition of the null set. If one of the conjuncts is false, the whole conjunction is false. If the antecedent of either implication is false, then the whole implication is true. So since the antecedents of both implications are false, both of the conjuncts of the big conditional are true, so the whole conditional is, or the whole conjunction rather, is true. Hopefully that helps. If it doesn't, we're going to do a line by line proof to give you a better sense. But I would encourage you to try it on your own if you haven't already. So there's the big long statement we're going to try to prove. We're going to do this without assumed proofs. We're just going to do it with our definitions just to show a couple of different ways to do these kinds of proofs. So we'll start with our null set definition for all b, b is not a member of the null set, and then we'll instantiate that down to a small b, b is not a member of the null set, non-membership definition to bring that negation outside. Then we're going to use addition because we kind of have to build these statements up. So we have it's not the case that b is a member of the null set or it's not the case that a is a subclass of b. We're also going to do addition on premise three with it's not the case that B is a member of the null set, or it's not the case that A is a member of B. Hopefully you can see that those correspond to the two halves of our statement that we're trying to prove eventually. They may not be clear right now, but it's going to get clearer the farther down we go. So we'll use transposition on each of those to switch around our two values uh, so that the claim about the null set is in the second part and the other claim is in the first part. This is just cleaning things up so it's going to look exactly like the statements we're going for. We'll then use De Morgan's law on each of them to pull those negations out and to leave a conjunction in the middle of instead of a disjunction. 
We'll then go ahead and use addition again on both of these. This time we're adding A is a member of the null set to the end of both of them. Remember with addition you can add anything you want because it's a disjunction you've already proven the first half of the statement. Then we're going to use implication twice to change those disjunctions into implication because we've denied both of the antecedents of them or both the first parts of the disjuncts. Then we just have to universally instantiate a lot of things. We'll universally instantiate the second part first, so we'll universally instantiate our Bs into Ys and Zs, and we'll universally instantiate our As into Xs and Ws. Then, just with conjunction, we end up with our full statement. Hopefully that made sense. Basically what we did was we worked out from the part we we're aware of. The Y is not a member of the null set and Z is not a member of the null set. Working out from that, we were able to show the whole conjunction. Up next, does the universe only contain the null set? This is going to be another proof. I encourage you to try this on your own before we get to that video. And in that video, we're going to show how to do it. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.